Hello and welcome to another episode of the Agile Podcast, a special bonus episode of the Agile Podcast, which is completely free for everybody. This time, Paul and I got together with an old friend of the podcast and a massive supporter of the Agile community in general, Vasco Duart. Um, so Vasco is the host of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. If you haven't heard that, check it out. It's been going on for over seven years now. It's got hundreds of episodes. They're all free. Um, and he's also the organizer of a completely free three-day conference that happens every year called the Agile Online Summit. So check that out. Like I said, all free. Great guy. Today, we picked up a question that was asked in my Agile Mastery community uh, around an interview question that a lot of people seem to be getting asked these days, which is how do you measure your team's performance? So somehow an hour flew by while we were discussing the intricacies and the nuances of this. We hope you enjoyed it. Settle in, have a drink. Here's the jingle. Right, here we are. I I don't suppose you've got your your agile podcast glass, Paul. Wherever you are, I don't know where you are. No, but I have been given. You see this merch, Vasco? See see this? That's great merch. I should get one of those. Yeah, they're quite hard to send in the post. (laughs) (laughs) I imagine you have already a couple of tricks on that. So uh, yeah, welcome everybody back um, from the summer break. I think. In England, it went from summer to winter in the space of 24 hours. We had the air conditioning on one day and the heating on the next, and that was it. Summer gone. I don't know what it's like in, in Helsinki for you, Vasco, but um, still warm? Yeah, we still have a couple of warm days. Like today was still very warm, so we're not complaining. Let's say it's quite rare to have a warm September here in Helsinki, but we do have it now, and uh, we are counting our lucky... Uh, what, what, what is the expression? Yeah, count your lucky stars, yeah. Count your lucky yeah. stars, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. So have you got a drink? I have a drink. I have um, a La Frog uh, single malt scotch whiskey. Oh, wowzers. Very, very uh, peaty, that one, isn't it? Yeah, it's very peaty. I love it. And also because I wanted to get a, a British drink, I didn't have anything else that was British here. So Nice. <laughs> How about you, Paul? Well, I... Uh... I ran to see what I could find from the, the, I'm in a hotel bar and they've actually given me it's so I'm in Bristol in the West country. So they go, they went with something safe. I went with Thatcher's, which is uh, pretty much in every rose. bar. And Thatcher's, Thatcher's rose, but they've given me, you say about your, your glass, Jeff, look at this. This is a lovely Thatcher's glass. Look at that. Oh yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's got a special kind of cider glass to it. I actually yeah, that, enjoy this. That looks like something that would fit quite nicely into your bag. Well, you never <laughs> know, isn't it? Maybe, maybe. Don't tell anyone. Well, I'm I'm drinking something very strange. It's called Bundobust. <laughs> I'll show you the the can. Look at that. So many questions. So many questions. It's got it's got frogs and a sort of alligatory crocodile type thing. It's a collaboration between my local brewery, Daya, and um, who else is it a collaboration with? Vic, I don't know, Vic Secret, that's the hops. I'm sure it was a collaboration. Can't see now. They have pretty no. interesting artwork on the cover. Yeah, loads of it. So these, are, it's, 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 it's a sort of cloudy. Can't see through that, can you? It's light, but cloudy. Blends in with your, your uh, the wood effect behind you, Jeff, and can't, can barely see it. Is, it. Yeah. it. Smells a bit sort of mangoey maybe fruity oh my god i i hate fruity beers but it doesn't taste fruity okay that's good i like the british beers especially because the there are some of them are quite bitter and i i really like my beers to be bitter yeah now this um 
It's 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 really quite pleasant. What, what's the what's the percentage? What's the alcohol? Why can't I see it? Oh, only f oh, it's five. It's five. It's a it's a normal one. Nothing particularly. But yeah, it's um got a, t a very slight, very slight tang, but very smooth. It doesn't taste as hazy as it looks. So when people uh, tune into my podcast, they tune in, for example, for book recommendations. I imagine that in your podcast, they tune in for the beer recommendations well, as well. <laughs> we, we did get pulled up on that once, uh, that we weren't giving enough of a description of, of the drinks that we were drinking. So um, yeah, we had to make a point, really, of, of explaining a little bit. And I'm not a particular connoisseur. Uh, and Paul's standard line, it's almost become a catchphrase that he'll have on a T-shirt one day, taste of apples. Um, <laughs> But yes, um, yeah, your podcast that people tune tune in for much more serious, much more intellectual, um, it's more highbrow. Information. Yeah, more highbrow. So yes, this we've got we've got a special guest with us today, Vasco Duarte, uh, the host, agile coach and host of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, and also organizer of the Agile Online Summit, which is a free, mark that free, <laughs> conference with some amazing keynote speakers and tracks um, all dedicated to try and uh, help all those scrum masters out there in the world so welcome thank you for joining us thank well, you very nice much it's a pleasure to be here I so yeah what, what have you been up to recently I mean, you you guys have been on my podcast and i was like feeling a bit left out so <laughs> thank you for inviting me yeah this is the uh, the away leg the return journey yeah. <laughs> indeed indeed well i mean um some of the stuff that that has been going on on my uh corner of the agile world uh we've been working a lot on on you know bringing new voices uh in the community uh to the to the knowledge of everybody um i think that when we started the scrum master toolbox podcast one of the chief motivators for us was to exactly depict agile as it is lived by the people who do it in practice hmm. right like all three of us we talk about it a lot right it's our job yep right but we also need to give voice to those that actually do it a lot and some of them know perhaps as much or even more than we do and mm -hmm. and that's great and others are just starting the their journey and their stories are also motivating and inspiring for the people out there who are potentially also starting their journey. So the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast is, is what I would call a uh, podcast uh, by the practitioners for the practitioners. So we interview Scrum Masters every week, uh, five questions every weekday. And uh, every now and then we have bonus episodes uh, uh, on which uh, at least uh, Jeff has been. I don't recall if Paul has been in a bonus episode, but I, I, Jeff has been for sure. Mm. So who are some of the up and coming names that we should be looking out for? And what some of your favorite episodes recently? Actually, at the, the week that we are recording, uh, there's a, a, a guy also from the UK, Robbie Ross, uh, who has this amazing phrase, which I love. The moment I heard it, I said, OK, that's my phrase from now on. Hmm. I'm going to steal it, but also give credit to Robbie Ross, who's on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. Um, and uh, the, the, the catchphrase is, instead of continuous improvement, he uses the phrase relentless improvement. And I just love that because it, it so depicts the ethos behind the idea of continuous improvement in a better way than the original phrase did, right? So I, I really love that relentless improvement. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and he did it with a smile and, and with a fun attitude and, and uh, that of course even adds more to it. I like it. That's the phrase I was using today actually was, um, it sounds a little bit, little bit marketing, but I was saying Billy Scrum Master, I was talking to teaching Scrum Masters today. And we were talking about believing in better, which again sounds like a bit of a supermarket catchphrase. But um, it's that it's not necessarily putting a number on it or a uh, or a, an endpoint on it. It's just generally having this belief that there must be a there must be something we can improve on. Isn't that a Sky advertising slogan? Is that believe is that believing better? Right, I have I stolen so. it? Have I ripped I think it off? So. Okay. It's, luckily, it's subliminal like, marketing at its best. It's entered your consciousness. <laughs> luckily, it works outside the UK uh, without that connotation. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So there we go. Cool. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I want to, it would be useful to get your opinion on this because I, I think we're going to we were planning on tackling something a bit 
a bit tricky today. Um, I've been asked a few. They weren't necessarily asked. They weren't necessarily asking me, but we were having a conversation about interviews because um, a lot of people have been changing jobs recently and mm -hmm. are still changing jobs, and companies still trying to hire people. Um, and we were sort of getting some pretty tricky questions, not necessarily because of what. Well, not, I suppose tricky in, in, in different ways in that quite often the people asking the questions have a different interpretation of Agile than the people who are answering the questions, which makes it quite tricky to give either a good answer or the answer that the interviewer wants to hear. Mm. Um, but also, they're, they're just quite tricky subjects. So it's, it's useful that we've got uh, someone else here to help us with this because they think they're quite tough. Mm. Um, so, I mean, the first one that, that people asked me was, how would you measure your team's performance? That is awesome. So, so before we dive into that, I don't know if you guys already want to come in, but let me say that I've been asked that question many times, as I imagine many of your listeners have had, have had the opportunity to talk about evaluation of performance. Uh, let me just say that, that one of my approaches to answering questions like that is not to give one answer, is to give many, many, many answers. In fact, that's <laughs> the whole core of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. That's why we call the podcast the Toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, uh, I got inspired by the story of my dad, who's a carpenter, and obviously, like all carpenters, he has a huge toolbox, and whatever problem you face, you pick a different set of tools right? It, it, you're still the carpenter. It, it's still the same toolbox, but you just pick a different set of tools yeah. when you're there in that situation, seeing what's going on, right? So maybe that's something we could play around with as we answer these questions. Instead of trying to come up with one answer, maybe we can try to come up with multiple answers and encourage our listeners to also say, hey, you could do it this way, or you could do it that way, or that way. It depends on the context, because it does. And here's a few things to consider in that context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, the, the phrase that I was taught for that one was entrenched expertise. If you only rely, if you're an expert in one tool, then you know, if that tool is a hammer, every problem you see tends to look like a nail. Um, so yeah, having having the ability to, to understand the context and pick the right tool for the job. I think so, there's also there's also a big difference between what, depending on who you ask, um, what performance would be assessed as. I think there's a danger of um, met team members. Uh, well, there's a fear element in it as well. If they were, if you were to ask a team member, would they be honest enough to name something that they want to want to be assessed on? or rather would they name something they believe they can score well on if not that so there's mm. there's a there's a game playing behind this so it's very hard i think to get to something absolute straight away it's very i think it's very much an experimental thing but um i've seen teams that have basically asked the team and then asked um those stakeholders outside the team and tried to compare the two and tried to compare and contrast is there crossover can we have a blend? Can we have some of of one and some of the other? Yeah. But it's, it's a it's a potential minefield. Also, the context there. Uh, not, not just potential. Sorry to interrupt. It it is a minefield. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah, I think uh, for me then. So the first thing to put out there in, in into the into the context is how safe does that team feel mm. about being measured? Mm. So the safer they are, perhaps the deeper the measurement. Mm. Um, and the less safe they are, the more superficial uh, the measurement, perhaps. Um, you know, uh, plenty of plenty of first-hand experience of teams you know, faking measurements because of the fear of consequences. Um, and nobody's nobody's winning there. Nobody's winning. So, yeah, the I, I'm tempted to say something that that. I'd like to think would sound clever, but probably won't, which is for me, a team's performance is whether or not they are doing, they are the best team that they can be in that moment in time. Um, because it's, there's always going to be competing forces on short term, long term, you know, team bonding over focused what, what 
Linford Christie would call tunnel vision, yeah, that focus on the, the delivery of the end line, the, the, the end of the sprint, that kind of thing. Um, and depending on where that team is and where the organisation is right now, optimum would mean different things. Yeah. I think as, um, I was going to add something else then. There's, would you want, because I, I was always thinking about happiness and morale, right? So you can, you can get an indication of morale and happiness, but you can have a very happy team that's not delivering anything. Mm -hmm. And you can have a miserable team who's really, you know, achieving, basically propping a company up in terms of the delivery and, that they're making. So I don't, whilst I think morale is one of those things that's easy to, easy to measure, and I, I think it is an indication. Um, it can be a complex, a complex metric. I was more thinking about, it made me think about flow. And again, that kind of nice, um, Csikszentmihalyi's kind of uh, diagram there, that kind of the different aspects of of uh, performance and um, ability against the task and against where we are and almost plotting where team members think they are in terms of the task that they're asked to, asked to achieve and how close to that top right-hand corner are we in terms of... Because I think flow is a good... If we've, if we've got flow, we're achieving. And, you know, we're not necessarily... It's not directly linked to happiness, but I think it can be. And it can be certainly linked to performance. So what, one uh, uh, other aspect that we need to take into account is that teams are in uh, an organization, we assume, given mm. that we're interviewing for an organization that has its own performance measure. So I would ask, okay, so how are we measuring the performance of the organization and how could we link the performance of the team towards the performance of the organization should we even look at metrics that are beyond the team and mm. rather look at the system of teams so system is also a topic uh, Deming used to say that uh, a, a bad system will take down a good person every time or something like that mm. which is in my experience a, a, a very um, it, it's a frequent pattern that I've observed for sure um, and and also uh, one thing that is implicit in performance evaluation which you guys already alluded to is why are we doing it in the first place right are we doing it as a, um, a a kernel of source of information for improvement or are we doing it as a way to measure people so that we can give them a bonus on a on a bell curve mm. right because i've been asked this right and uh, as an example one of the teams that i worked with they decided together that they would give each other the exact same evaluation so that every team member would get the same evaluation. But in some companies, that's not allowed. You have to rate people on a curve. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and then the other aspect that comes from that, which is it's kind of pushed by fear and pushed by these metrics, is the aspect of sustainability. We, we, we have a, a great keynote in the uh, Agile Online Summit about sustainability. Uh, pardon the the uh, propping up of the summit here but uh, sustainability is an extremely important topic I mean in scrum we call it sustainable pace yeah. but it's not just sustainable pace it's also the level of happiness is part of sustain uh, sustainability in the team the level of cooperation with other teams is a, a an aspect of sustainability the value delivery frequency and customer uh, feedback is also an aspect of sustainability and of course the uh, uh, a topic I like to talk a lot uh, about, which is the death march rate, right? Like h how much of our work is actually crunch time mm. versus how much of our work is focusing on value delivery and quality rather than crunch time, get, you know, s all this stuff done by a particular deadline. So definitely sustainability would need to be a, a way to measure performance, if nothing else, as a, as a balancing metric. I want to I want to flag that because I so I really want to dig down into that one, but I can't let the other, this other thing, I don't want to let this other thing go, which is around what you say about crunch. And so many organizations reward the wrong things. You know, I can think back to some teams that Paul and I have been on in the past, years and years and years ago, where the organization would reward, like monetarily reward, and you know, mm. just publicly um, laud and applaud the firefighters. And when you when you reward firefighters, you get arsonists because people know that's what's rewarded. Um, so, uh, 
this idea of crunch time, you know, I'm looking for the teams that are pretty quiet, really, you know, that are just going along quite nicely, which I think fits to your sustainability thing quite well. But this, I'm hoping that sustainability is a word that is going to continue in people's consciousness after what was called COP26, you know, this idea from, from an ecological sustainability point of view. But if you take that at a generic level, it's basically, can we, can we, not, can we avoid overusing resources? Okay, whether they be the natural resources of, of, of the planet mm -hmm. or whether they be the resources of an organization or a team or an individual. So can we make sure that we can keep going indefinitely, not just with our energy, but with the the intangible thing, the other intangible things like you're saying there about, well, are we actually uh, putting too much, asking too much of other teams or the processes or um, happiness um, and you know, the political um, debit, I would say, rather than you know, political goodwill. All of those things, I think, factor into uh, is the team not just performing as a team, but as a corporate, I was just going to say citizen, but obviously a team isn't a citizen, but the, met the metaphorical unit of delivery, within them, they are just part of the system. Mm. I think that's also an industry specific thing as well, isn't it? The, the idea of the crunch. Um, and the one I was thinking about is the computer games industry, which I know historically has a, has a, um, when you approach a launch, it's just all hands to the pump and it's, and to a degree, I'm not, don't, don't quote me on this, but there's a, an element of, we don't care how many developers this burns through. We've just got to get it done. We've just got to get this thing over the line. And this is similar in other industries as well, like the visual effects industry, that time, the whole thing of burning through companies just because we need to hit a deadline and not necessarily caring about the long-term impacts i think i think churn and i think um turnover of of, of team members is a, was also a good indication of performance in my Yet view another tool to measure yeah. right like that i think that this conversation already highlights the importance of looking at uh the performance evaluation as a lot more than you know who's the best on a team or who's or what is the best team on a group of teams but it reflects the importance of us thinking that actually we are here for the survival and hopefully also also for the thriving of a business that serves mm. customers for a purpose. And <clears throat> evaluating one team definitely has an impact on how we serve customers, but it's not the only thing that has that impact, right? So like uh, the, the, the aspect of how do we link these two together, right? The, the fact that we do want to reward teams that, you know, make a great effort versus actually it doesn't matter what effort they make because if the company doesn't survive, mm. it's still, you know, it's, it's a mute point. Like there's no rewards for anyone, yeah. right? So uh, one aspect that I've uh, played with and actually suggested that in some of the companies where I've worked is to think about monetary re reward as pure profit sharing, right? If the company does well, everybody does well, and you can do it as a percentage of salary because salaries are not equal. That's fine. We can argue whether they should be or not, but that's not my point. So in terms of monetary value, you would solve that problem. You wouldn't need performance evaluation for the monetary rewards, which is very important. And then kind of pipe the, the uh, performance evaluation towards an improvement cycle which could be, for example, surfacing systemic problems. Like in that context, it makes sense to measure performance. If we look at performance outcome as a consequence of how we set up the system, that information is useful and is useful exactly to those that are asking for it, which is management. Management's main responsibility is to manage the system. It's not the people, it's the system, right? It's, it's how people are treated, it's what kind of uh, boundaries and, and policies we put in place. That's management's responsibility. And if we do that, then yes, then performance evaluation makes sense. And we could use a number of different metrics for that, like the flow metrics that Paul already alluded to. Mm. Oh, something else, something good. Mm. It was good. We can, we can edit out the pause, Jeff, if you need time to think. <laughs> Do you guys talk about Deming a lot here, or you don't usually? Not massively. Not really, no. No. 
Like say, we're not as highbrow as you. Ah! We're, not, we're not as intelligent. He's a, curm he's a curmudgeon. I mean, he's uh, he's. Uh, I think his avatar would be this kind of old man saying, "Get off my lawn, you young people." <laughs> but uh, he does have some uh, very very important insights. You um you you're quoting Deming um, and this is again just gives you an idea of how, idea of how different um I think here, Pasco. I'm not going to speak for Jeff. Jeff's a lot more intelligent than me, but I was think <laughs> I was thinking about um, championship manager. So Je that might mean something to Jeff, and I'm not sure if it means it resonates with you. But I was thinking in championship manager, which was our kind of football um, manager simulation game that Jeff and I pretty much grew up in in the '90s. You for a for a player, you'd have you wouldn't what twenty attributes, Jeff, something like that. You'd be given and all sorts of stats and all sorts of. Um, trends and patterns and awards and bonuses that they were given and yeah instinctively uh if you got good at the game you'd be <laughs> for a particular play you'd look for a certain number of attributes everyone would be assessed on a number of attributes but for certain players in certain positions you'd be looking for certain things and i'm almost thinking now is there something you could do for a kind of team profile type thing that there'll be a set of 20 odd uh, attributes that we all have but we can pick five that we could kind of specialize in and that's what we choose that we'd like to be assessed by well I, you know I, I encourage teams to to define their own definition of what kind of team they want to be it, it fits in nicely with my view of of coaching you know the team holds the agenda in this case i assume all things being equal that a team when given the choice would rather be better tomorrow than they are today yeah um so what do they want to get better at and as long as they're getting better, the organization is getting better, all things being equal, not all the time, but most of the time. So uh, operating on that principle, then, you know, I, I, I've drawn patterns and, and found, generally speaking, that if, we're, if, if this team is, has a passion for getting better, if they take quality seriously, if they actually care about one another as, as, as human beings as well as colleagues, they, they're, they're, they're taking calculated gambles to work outside of their comfort zone and they're delivering stuff then that team is doing doing great mm. um, and yes you can get down into more detail and you you can you can break it down even further and so on but my my view is if if they're not if they're not doing those things then something in the system is broken because it's 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 taking away their natural motivation so how can we identify that and fix it and and isn't it uh, a kind of a, a dilemma for us as scrum masters when when we know that sometimes the reasons why teams are not wanting to improve is that the managers who ask us how to evaluate teams mm. are the ones creating the environment that leads the teams to want to hide information as yeah. an example mm. well I, I i often tell a story about you know, this this group of group of managers at an organization and one of them said see I don't agree with you Jeff because people are lazy and people need to be managed you can't go around letting people define their own goals define their own targets picking their work managing themselves people need to be managed and I was prepared for a, you know an interesting conversation you know it was going to be an interesting day uh, but I didn't need to really because one of his colleagues said well that's really interesting because my people in my area are pretty good so you must just be hiring badly or something. But we had this big discussion about actually people will live up to or mm. in some cases down to your expectations of them. And now what was what was it took me quite a while to actually figure out, I'm talking probably months or even years, is that that, that guy who stood up and said, Dunno, Jeff, people are lazy, he wasn't just saying it to be difficult. He had evidence. He had empirical evidence that backed up his view because of confirmation bias right he and he got what he was looking for he noticed what he was looking for and if people thought well he doesn't believe in me so i'm just gonna well if he thinks i'm lazy i might as well just do the bare minimum he's got more evidence that backs up his view so it's very difficult you got one truth against another truth but partly that truth was self-created and and Thank it, 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 I think it meant more that his colleague raised it than if I'd have raised it, because I was an outsider. You know, I was a I was a naive tree hugger. 
compared to his colleague, who was another hard-nosed financial person. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've I've seen that a lot. Um, well, one way to explain this is you get what you project on to people. So mm. there's the confirmation bias, which is absolutely true, but there's also something in, in English you guys use the phrase uh, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, mm -hmm. right? And because I know that my people are lazy, I'm going to treat them as if they are lazy. Mm -hmm. And what that means in practice is that you end up creating the conditions on which laziness is what is expected. Yeah. Even though you might reward the firefighters, actually you're really looking at a moment when the firefighter has a lazy moment and then you go like, okay, this is what all the people are like. That would be the confirmation bias. But then you create evaluation metrics and you create one-to-one -one relationships and you know you punish people for being lazy. So it become lazy becomes kind of this narrative that overrules everything, right? Mm. Even the firefighters, even the crunch teams, the crunch time teams will be called lazy, even though they they were working. If you remember all the weekends a month ago because of a deadline you created that mm. didn't need to be created but because this week and i have a story to tell this i have to tell this story in a second because this week they took a day off then they're lazy and and this actually happened to a friend of mine so she's crunch time she's working for a major telco in portugal and they have a new billing system to install and uh, i'm sure all of the people who work with software know how this goes there's a, a switch over point which is probably like 2 a.m on a sunday mm -hmm. and you have to do it at that time and and she's working there she goes home at 6 a.m gets a shower gets breakfast gets back to the office at 10 30 and her boss goes to her and says why are you here this late yeah. I, I, I did. I, I did. I tried something. I took a gamble this week. Um, so I was doing a workshop for a large number of people, part of a department, um, and it was a uh, kind of team building on a on a large scale, if you like. It was you know strategy alignment and and values and things for a large for a large department of a big company. And um, I got them all playing a game, so that we, we split them up into, I think, maybe six different teams of about, say, 15, something like that. And um, it was an iterative game, so they had the chance to, to get better, but they also knew how they were doing. And about halfway through the game, the, the, the scores across the teams were really, 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 really different from low to, to very, very high. And I just picked one of them that was in the middle score wise and I said just um, just out of interest in case you're interested if I was going to put a bet if I was going to put money on any team in here winning at the end of this it would be this team and I just picked one in the middle hmm. and lo and behold that team won all right so at the end of it I asked I asked the whole group why do you think I picked that team and they said oh you must have noticed something you've obviously seen it before and they were doing something that you'd seen before uh, any other ideas? Is it, um, did you did you did you tell them what to do? Did you give them like hints and answers? I said no, no. I said genuinely, I've done this many times before. This was this was the lie. I said I've done this many times before, and it doesn't matter who I pick, they always end up winning. What does that tell you? Uh, I said. So then I asked the team that I picked. I said, how did you feel when I said I thought you were going to win? They thought, oh, we must be doing something right. Jeff thinks we're going to win, so their motivation went up instantly, and and they started doing better. In fact, they changed what they were doing and started improving, whereas the others started thinking, "Oh, we must be doing something wrong," and sort of lost motivation. And that sense of belief, okay, in this case, it wasn't particularly genuine belief, but they didn't know that. Um, but they believed in themselves that they someone was believing in them and and they were but equally the opposite and the other teams the other five teams didn't do as well arguably arguably because they didn't think mm. i believed in them so it's that it, but it's that dichotomy isn't it is in that case to take it literally jeff is one team succeeding and it's achieving greatness better 
or worse than five teams that have suffered or five, five teams that are under delivering. And no. I, I don't know if this actually was the case in your game, Jeff, but in, in the real world out there in product development, all of those teams would be interlinked and dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. And one team winning actually means that somebody else needs to lose Losing for exactly, that yeah. team to win. Yeah. But the only way they win is for the others to sacrifice, to give them something. Yeah. yeah. No, so that, this, this was the first game of the day where they were very, they were completely independent of one another. Yeah. Um and so we allowed their natural competitive spirit to to thrive. And later on in the day, I I, I offered another game where the only way they could win is by all teams collaborating and some mm. teams actually sacrificing themselves for um for the greater good. Mm. Yeah, it, it that's that's the big part of it. And I wouldn't I wouldn't say that was successful. I wouldn't. And and I think, you know, Vasco you said about the bell curve type thing. That, that kind of performance man management metric has been around for so long and it, it generally demotivates everyone because even the people who who are at the top think that well they could literally all agree to do worse mm. and there would still be the same results there's that a was, very yeah. famous guy who made a lot of money and was very famous on that bell curve idea jack welch uh gm uh, mm -hmm. manager who said every every year i fire the low 10 percent, like the lowest performing 10 percent. i was like you idiot in order for those guys to be the low 10 percent, right they were the low 10 percent because of helping others mm. you're you're if you're firing the low performers you're actually telling everybody don't help each other yeah. what do you think that will create well it looked like it created a lot of money for him <laughs> it did there's no arguing with that yeah yeah by the way uh, th there nice was a um uh, another point i wanted to point out the the moment we start measuring someone that affects their performance that yeah. it's in it's impossible to avoid if they know they are being measured or even just observed it affects their performance there's a uh, uh a very well known uh well uh study called the or, or the effect is called the Hawthorne effect, which was uh, about measuring performance in factories. And anything you change will affect the performance in that factory. And the same is happening with our teams. You give them a more attentive scrum master, <laughs> their performance will change. You, you give them a more cooperative QA, their performance will change. You tell them they're being evaluated, their performance will change. So it, it really comes to the point that we as, you know, let, let's imagine we are the hiring managers and we're asking that question we need to figure out what is it that we are trying to achieve not how do we want to measure teams but what what is it that we're trying to achieve and how do we make sure that the teams themselves can measure themselves mm. right and hold themselves accountable to that overall systemic goal because at the end of the day the game of business is won by the company getting better not by every individual team getting better mm. often um tell a story that i don't think ken reads or listens to anything i do do so <laughs> he hasn't he hasn't got around to uh uh putting a court injunction on me yet but he um ken schwaber this is he, he he was once asked about teams performance and he said so the person in the in the in the class said i can see how this works with great people really you know really good people they're technically skilled and you know um you know, with all the information they need, the environments they need, with management support and stuff, but you know, Scrum's not going to work with the average person, the average team. And Ken said, "No, you don't understand. Scrum works with idiots. Uh, you can have a bunch of people who've never been to college before, who you know hate each other, um, never done software development, can't even tie their own shoelaces, raving alcoholics. Doesn't matter because you stick them in a room with an ordered product backlog for thirty days." And Scrum works absolutely fine. Now, at the end of it, you probably have a pile of bleep. But you now know empirically what that team's capable of, and you can choose what to do with it. You could sack them all if you want. You could send them to rehab. You could provide some training. You could give them a Scrum Master. You could change one of the, the, the team members, whatever, and then give them another sprint and see if they do better. And that is Scrum working. So there's, there's a lot of... There is truth to that in that Scrum is about empiricism. So what... Uh, what are the other questions that they wanted us to answer which you know we've actually spent so long talking about team performance we probably won't have time is how do you prove scrum is working well scrum is working if you are getting real information really really quickly now 
So what you do with that information determines, I would say, how agile you are because it's going to it's going to question your values and whether those values are in line with the agile values. So are you going to go and fire the the lowest, you know, the weakest link on the team? Are you going to fire the the, the lowest 10%? Are you going to force them to work overtime until they get what what are you going to do with that information that's the key which i think brings us all the way back around to paul's opening comment around psychological safety mm. what do we think is going to happen if if we do our best if we are open about our abilities and our performance uh, and do do our leaders do our managers actually believe that we want to do a good job I think, and this ties together some of the points we've been making, and I'm in danger of generalizing far too much here, but I think, and this is probably our history, Jeff and I come from similar companies here, but I still believe there's a proportion of the workforce for a company that will think, does it really matter? So almost like, regardless of what I say, is this going to make a difference to me? Um, dare I say, am I going to lose my job? You know, it just very much just teams, a, a, a large number of, number of people that I've worked with and know of even now that are just happy to keep just a little bit underneath the radar and just to keep, uh, keep paying the mortgage, mortgage driven development. If I, if I, if I just <laughs> do, if I just do enough, and I don't make a make a big. Maybe it's a British thing. I don't know. But, no, but it's... tallest grass gets cut first. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Uh, so I I don't know if that's British. I I would say that that's actually a global phenomena. But uh, fr from my perspective, I think it is a natural consequence of how we set up the work for these teams. I mean, mm. how many teams that you? I mean, you've talked to many teams all over the years that you've been training and coaching teams. How many teams? are given the opportunity to be genuinely proud of what they are producing for their customers, mm. right? Like I, I've worked with some teams that, you know, they, they could, I mean, I worked at Nokia, we were producing very popular mobile phones. That was before the iPhone, by the way. <laughs> and everybody was proud to work there. And, yeah. and these people, they would do amazing things, even without Scrum. I'm not saying Scrum did it. I'm saying the people did it because they had a genuine opportunity to be proud of what they were doing, right? And and if if we find that there's a lot of mortgage-driven develop, um, development in our organizations, MDD, we have to ask, do we give them any reason to be proud? Mm. Yeah. Were you both at Nokia at the same time? Good question. Was, 2009 was, to 2011, I was there. Yeah, so Paul left, uh, well, yeah, actually, I, I joined 2008 and also left in 2011. Oh. I think a lot of us left in 2011. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a big, yeah, big mass. There was the burning platforms memo. That's right, yeah. yeah that's that's right. when I started looking for a new job, when I heard yeah. that thing. Yeah, but I think we were, pro if you were in uh, Finland, I was in Bristol. So, yeah, we're probably, probably working on different products, different time. But, yeah, genuinely, yeah, a real people that were really infused by the products that they were building and yeah they did want to have a say they did want they they were passionate enough to to want to be part of it and to and the best results i've seen are ones not not in not i'm not talking about knocking now but where com smaller companies that i'm i'm coaching and work with where the, the the ceo and the board stand up and say we want your input we want to, we want to tailor this stuff but we want your support and we want your say in how these things are measured and, and, and kind of resetting even as far as like team values, but not just team values, like company values. How, how does, what do we determine as success if we're achieving not, maybe not in a specific measurable way, but in terms of the direction and the way that we want to work. Um, and so, I think one leads to the other. So I, I, I'm going to try and, uh, put myself in the position of the customer in this context. So the person who asked this question, right? And they've listened so far. They've listened to us talk for fifty minutes on this on this topic, and all they've heard is it depends. All right. <laughs> yeah. So they're going to come back and say, "But I'm in this interview, guys." And the interviewer is going to say, "So, so after all that, what's your answer? How do you measure a team's performance? Mm. What's your answer?" I, I that's a very good question. So what I would say is, what's important for you? 
and then take all of what I said into account and make sure you're not pushing the team to do something that isn't contributing to what you want. Oh, nice. And, and the question, I mean, for me, this is really, I work with product developers all the time, right? One part of the work that I do is coaching product owners. And it is really hard to get product owners to understand that they are not there to deliver features. Mm. They are not there to get more software developed. They are there to solve real problems that, and here's the kicker, only the customer knows they have it. The product owner does not know. Product owner is a specialist on the solution domain, not on the problem domain. The customer is the specialist on the problem domain. And, and the, the POs don't even ask their customers. Mm. Right. So, of course, the first thing, if, if I was being hired by, a, let's say, a, um, a, a leader of a product organization that was asking that question, I would say, how do you measure your organization? Because if, if we can't measure the teams in line with what you measure in your organization, it, it's all a lost cause. Mm. Right. It's like uh, uh, shooting in the dark at a, 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 a target that is perhaps in the wrong direction. Yeah. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a, that's a good answer. And it actually reminded me of what I'd forgotten earlier on, which which is so many teams complain to me that they're, they're being asked to normalize their velocity or their velocity is being compared against another team. And I, and I can completely empathize with that. Um, and I, I actually don't mind teams' numbers being compared against each other as long as they're the right numbers so i wouldn't be comparing velocity ever right but i would be interested in how much value business value each team each product is delivering so when you say what do you measure what do you want and how much is this team contributing to that that uh, you know I, I'll, I'll often go in and say jeff dollars you know, how many Jeff dollars is this feature worth? How many Jeff dollars is this product worth compared to the others? And we want to be we want to be delivering that. We want to be delivering Jeff dollars. So if one team or one product is delivering more than another, that's that's got to be our focus. You know, would I rather have two teams working on that product than one on each? Well, that's an interesting question to ask. So a team could be doing brilliant work. They could be the best team in the company, but if they're working on a bad product idea what's the point yeah the, the biggest way the, the biggest waste is the work that we do that doesn't yeah. solve any customer problem so yeah i mean you could depending on how brave if you're in this interview depending on how brave you're feeling depending on how much you want the job depending on how much you want to impress i suppose it's just the the uh, the awkward part of my personality would say you could straight face just say um how would you if you ask the question how would you measure performance just straight face poker face just say velocity and just leave it there <laughs> and see, and then and then see, and then you can test the reaction of the your interviewer. <laughs> and this, and this is brilliant, Paul, because it is true <laughs> that in a job interview they are evaluating us as much as we are evaluating them. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the fail fast approach, I think, Paul. Hmm. Like and I say, a friend I'm, of I'm mine not... went to a bank job interview with sandals and shorts. Okay. Yeah. Because he wanted to test the culture. Mm. Yeah. I think it depends how much, like I say, how much you. You want the job and how much well I, yeah and it's easy to say isn't it if, if you're in a position where you don't need the job yeah but to i would want to work for a company that actually i i want to test them to see if this is a place that i want to be at um so how can i find that out as quickly as possible and i i don't think um again it's easy for me to say but i don't think it's as risky as most people think what what say that what what is it what is risky putting it back to them yeah 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 yeah. yeah. And, and and saying yeah well what's wrong with velocity <laughs> <laughs> my other answer to that question when you asked me directly would be my other when i thought about it i would answer it and so i'd say i would want to measure all the things that you think it's impossible to measure oh that's clever yeah see so what, like, what do yeah. you so, expect them to to react well How yeah just just to, just to get to let them know that I think there's things that are important that you're probably not measuring right now. Yeah. Or I'd ask them, what do you think is, tell me something that you think it's impossible to measure a team on, or just to start a question around, you know, that kind of thing. 
I might not have an answer for it, but you know, that's how so, I so squirm through an interview. So here's a way then, right? So I'll, I'll try and I'll try and bring it back a little bit. So for that person who is in the interview, who perhaps isn't as blasé as as you, Paul. Yeah. Um, so so hold on a minute. Let me just write something down. So, <laughs> so write down your actual answer. Yeah. You know, just a bullet point or two. Yeah. Fold it up and then say velocity. <laughs> And when they say, well, you can't be hired because velocity is terrible. You say, oh, good. I just wanted to test you. But here's my actual answer. Yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> that, that is good. That is good. Although you yeah. opened up your game. Now they know you're testing them. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I don't think those people are listening to our podcast. But anyway, <laughs> we do need, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we do need to wrap it up. I can't believe that's an hour gone already. We that's only answered one question. That was, that's insane. Well, that, that wasn't the intent. We'll have to do well, this again. Well, maybe maybe that's the tactic in an interview, isn't it? Just just get them talking about one topic that you really, really you like for an hour. Yeah. 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 Isn't yeah that if you get them talking terms, more, they're more likely to hire you, by yeah. the way. That's a that's yeah. tip there, gotten from salespeople. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. Was it called bridging in in politics? Yeah, filibustering, that's, isn't it? Oh, is it? Is that when you say that's a really interesting question? But I think the more important question we should be answering is. Oh yeah. no, no, filibustering is just talking so long that you use up the whole time, so oh, you I actually see. can't get on to the next most important thing. No, no, don't do filibuster. Just get <laughs> them to talk about how they measure teams because okay. that's important for you, and then you know how to answer. Yeah. True. Hey, Vasco. We we really really appreciate you being here. That that was amazing. Um, in return, could we could we allow you just to, to speak to our listeners about yeah, Joel, the online summit? Yeah, tell them, absolutely. Tell them why they should come. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for having me over. Um, uh, I've been editing and publishing the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast since 2015. Uh, so you do the counting of how many years that is, depending on what year you're listening to this episode. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, and uh, as part of the, the work that we do, which is bring new voices in the community to the common awareness of us all, but also share new knowledge, share stories in the first person. Uh, we're doing the Agile Online Summit where we're going to get, um, we're going to have up to 40 different talks by people in the community, plus a free coaching clinic. Uh, so if you join, uh, that's November 2nd to 4th, if you join at the right time, you will be able to ask questions from other coaches like Jeff and Paul and myself and get their support in, in, in your own journey. And uh, th this is what we believe in, right? We, we've been talking about how important it is to evaluate our employers, but it's also important to gather the knowledge from others. How do mm -hmm. others do it, right? So that's, you know, this uh, job uh, uh, um, application questions is definitely something you can come and ask on the uh, Agile Coaching Clinic of the Agile Online Summit, which is free, as uh, Jeff said at the start, November 2nd to November 4th, online at agileonlinesummit.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks for all you do. You know, the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast has been going, I don't know how many hundred of episodes you've done, they're all free. The Agile Online Summit is free, it's amazing. Um, you know, people like you, that's what keep the community going. So, brilliant to speak to you again. Um, <laughs> and cheers cheers Vasco cheers thank you guys all the best